Hello and welcome to Six Figure Authors, the show that helps you take your writing career to the next level. I'm Lindsay Baroker and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Joe Lalo. And I'm Andrea Pearson. And it's going to be just the three of us this week after a few weeks of interviews there. So we are going to talk about a few things that hopefully you'll find useful. We're going to brainstorm a little bit with each other at the beginning or masterminding, if you want to call three people a mastermind group, uh, about our, our own plans for 2020. And then we're going to talk about some mistakes we've made along the way, because for some reason in our old show, that was always a, uh, a favorite episode is hearing us talk about the ways we'd screwed up and that we're still able to become successful authors despite those things. And at the end, we will answer a few listener questions from the Facebook group. All right. Do you get, who wants to go first with talking about plans for what you're going to do in 2020? Uh, all right. So uh, my plans for 2020, um, I've been calling it the year of six because I have three main series and each of them have five books right now. And I'm hoping to release the sixth book of each of those series next year. Um, that will be not my only releases for the year, hopefully. I mean, if they are only the only releases for the year, that's a problem. But I'm hoping to release each of them roughly at the third marks of the year. And uh, each of them should be roughly a series conclusion. Uh, if not a series conclusion, at least uh, like a narrative arc conclusion so that I can sort of wrap these up and start looking at future stuff that's a little bit earlier on in the process. And it'll, it'll basically be an excuse for me to take three solid attempts at doing a late series launch because obviously my series are beginning later and later. They're each five books long and they've been going for, one of them been going for 10 years, which is another thing I'll be doing next year. I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, I've never really done a really solid, like coordinated push of the entire series. It's always been, here's my new book. And if you're not familiar with the series, here's book one. So this will be three separate attempts at putting together a promotional push for, uh, for a late series book. And hopefully it will evolve and improve as the year goes on. Um, I'm also going to try to give my Patreon a little bit more of a push, uh, spurred in part by uh, now that I've had a full year of Patreon and there's been at least one short story or novella every month, I'm going to wrap up the ones that aren't part of other series and make that into sort of an anthology collection. Again, anthology collections are kind of hard to market, but these have already been edited. Everything's already been paid for. They've already, they're basically already in the black. All I have to do is put a cover on it and put it out. So it's no reason not to do it. So I'll be putting that out and that'll be part of a method to try to get more people back into the Patreon. And then there's the fate of my urban fantasy, uh, which is to be determined. Uh, it was not a strong launch, but I'd hate to leave the plot unresolved. There's only three books out and I plotted it for five. I could conceivably finish it in four, but it's certainly not finished at three. So I'll be figuring out what I'm going to do with that in, in 2020. And also 2020 is the 10 year anniversary of me being an independent author. I, my very first book was released uh, in Jan January 28th of 2010. So I'll probably be doing something to celebrate that. Probably not in January, probably later in the year, but that's a thing I'm looking forward to do. So uh, that's what I'm doing for 2020. And since we'll be, we we're looking to do some brainstorming, uh, my topic that I'd like to brainstorm, we'll just go straight into that, is uh, my Urban Fantasy launch was pretty ill-fated. Uh, it, it didn't take off from the beginning, and as a result, the rapid release didn't really have a tremendous amount of impact. So the question is, should I continue to keep it Kindle exclusive through to the end of the series, or should I do like an attempted relaunch wide? Uh, and if I do either of those things, what tactics do you think I should use? Um, I'm going to go ahead and go first on that, if that's okay, Flinzy. Um, Okay, so I don't think you should abandon Urban Fantasy and Kindle Unlimited entirely. Um, it just, it depends on what your game plan is. So um, I don't know, Urban Fantasy is the genre I write the most. Um, I'm not like in the top 100 hardly ever, but you know, it, it does make money for me. Um, I think about continuing the series and then relaunches new books into Kindle Unlimited with new ASINs. It depends on how many reviews you have on them and you can also have Amazon push the, like roll those reviews over. But then, like I said, it depends on what your business model is. So like if releasing a book every three months, which is what I usually do um, into KU, um, it, that doesn't generally work for authors. A lot of the times it has to be a, a rapid release, meaning once a month, once every two months. Um, 
um, if you're not doing it at, that often, it generally doesn't get you as many KU benefits. And this is me speaking, you know, from experience from releasing a bajillion series into Kindle Unlimited and then generally taking them wide. Um, so releasing wide at that pace works fantastically though. So if you want to do, you want to take it wide, then I would just say, take it wide. Don't worry about relaunching. Um, and then just release the books as they come out. Um, let's see, what else was I thinking on that one? Uh, if you think you could release more frequently than that, I'd give Kindle Unlimited a continued shot because it takes time to build up a readership in Kindle Unlimited, especially in urban fantasy. It's a very congested, very um, competitive genre, subgenre. And so, um, but another thing to consider, it's like urban fantasy is not a huge seller wide in my experience. I've done decently wide with it, but I've always made more money in Kindle Unlimited on my urban fantasy books than I have wide. Um, but I don't know if you follow book, but they don't even have an urban fantasy category. They only have, they just barely start paranormal romance, but they still don't have an urban fantasy category. And that's one of the biggest subgenres of fantasy. But so I'm like, is that because book bub mirrors what is available wide? So they don't, they don't want to have it wide because there's not enough, a big enough wide audience, or is there not a wide enough audience for it because book bub doesn't have a category. So is it book bub's fault? That's my question. <laughs> um, but anyway, so yeah, so readers expect authors in Kindle Unlimited and Urban Fantasy to release frequently, right? So, I mean, what you could do is pull it down, like I was saying, and relaunch it as a new series, or just keep doing what you're doing and, and, and publish it wide. But I think, I don't think you should give up on that series. I mean, give it, because I plan on reading it. And if you don't finish it, I'm not going to read it. <laughs> He's nodding. We've got our, our mic, mics muted, but... <laughs> well, yeah, I, I got it. I, I, I mean, I always eventually finish stuff, but it's one of those where it's like, this was supposed to be my, like, this is it. We're going to see what my future of publishing is. And then it's just like, oh, it went. <laughs> um, but one thing I would say with what you're, with you were talking about, like if I was to relaunch it as, as new, you know, as, as new um, actual books, as opposed to just doing a promotional relaunch or that changing them at all. Is there any danger in confusing people who might've picked up the, this thing the first time thinking that I've got a new thing coming? because that's something that I would always sort of be anxious about. Um, I've, I've relaunched a couple of times with new ASINs and my readers, I mean, they're smart. You give them, they, you give them credit. And, and what I've done in my descriptions is I've said, formerly this title, you know, and then, I mean, the thing with it is it depends on how many downloads you've had. If you like my one series that I did the huge relaunch on, it had, It'd been published for like seven years, but it still hadn't gotten a whole lot of downloads. And by the time I relaunched it, my original readers weren't even there for that series anymore. And so I didn't have a lot of overlap. So it depends. I mean, if it's been a, a series that's had like thousands of thousands of downloads, that's more of a concern. But if, you know, it just depends, right? All right. Well, let me jump in with a few thoughts. Um, so... I've actually never relaunched anything with new ASINs or anything like that. I would, personally, I would probably wait for down the line, like if you're going to change the covers and really come at it from a different angle for that, um, especially since you just did your launch this past summer. But I do think you have three now. So when you get back to it, you could put together a box set of that first one through three and then try a little different blurb, maybe try to hit a different audience and go into different categories with it. So I, um, I kind of looked at your blurbs and to me, they sounded like I, I told you on Twitter, um, more like a mystery with a paranormal element than urban fantasy, kind of going by a mix of what's really selling on Amazon. Uh, Alex Newton from Kalytics, he has an urban fantasy report. I don't know if you've checked that out, but he kind of, by just scraping people's keyword or blurbs and stuff, he sees like how much wizard and magic and you know the different words are used and he gets a pretty good breakdown of like this is what the genre expects and i feel like um i don't know who you marketed it to but i know you've got it in urban fantasy i would be curious to see because i know under the mystery thriller suspense there's also like occult paranormal kind of stuff um because you you know just from the blurbs you've got the i think your main character starts out just as a normal guy photographer not like this is the badass wizard, you know, solving crimes, or this is Buffy the Vampire Slayer taking out a new monster in every episode. Because um, I feel like at least what urban fantasy is right now, hopefully this won't be too boring to all the people out there that <laughs> don't care about urban fantasy. Because I think a lot of us, though, uh, don't necessarily get, we're not necessarily writing the genre we think we are. <laughs> you know, I feel like 
modern representations of that would be like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, like I said, and then for Trad Publishing, uh, Jim Butcher with his wizard, those are a little more P the PI paranormal kind of thing. Um, but then Patricia Briggs, uh, you know, all these have a powerful central character, Ilana Andrews, Kate Daniels books we talked about. So I think that I, cause I learned that myself when I did a contemporary fantasy that I didn't have a powerful central character. I just had an everyday hero. And I think that was one of the reasons that series didn't really connect that much with people. So this time I've been, you know, reading a bunch of book ones, just kind of jumping around seeing just to make sure like I, I have to write the story I want to write, but I also want to try to make it close enough that I can have some comp authors to advertise <laughs> to target for advertising. And so bringing this back to you, I was wondering if you might get more mileage when you go back to it, sort of more advertising towards the X files type of readers, whatever they're reading. I don't know what, uh, maybe, you know, Joe, <laughs> more like what authors would be like that, but it seems to me a little bit different subset of readers than the people looking for the kick, kick ass, we can say kick ass on this show, can't we? We're going to ex explicit sure. markers for for the ASS word. Um, but those kind of tough guy, tough gal fantasy and, uh, you know, it just seems really typical for the, for that genre. Do you have any thoughts on that? I was going to touch on a couple of your other things, but do you want to rebut? <laughs> or does Andrew, no. we'll, we can say but, but it's okay. <laughs> no, no, I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. And it was, again, we were discussing this on, on Twitter a little bit, where like I was certainly following the, the Jim Butcher model because those were, I read whatever, a dozen of the Jim Butcher uh, Dresden Files books. So that was sort of the model I had in my head for what I would follow. And uh, I think probably by the time you get to book three, uh, the main characters are much more in line with like just the, you know, badass super powered people. Um, so it's possible that this will be another, by the way, another thing that Jim Butcher does is creates multiple entry points of the series. It could be a situation where if I do books four and book five, maybe do book four, five, and six, make four an entry point where they're a bit more, you know, now we've got characters who are heavy hitters and we can sort of start a new arc with them in there. That might be a good thing to do also. I'm curious, and maybe Andrea has thoughts on this too, how well that actually works for indie authors today, kind of in the Amazon ecosystem, where it's really obvious to somebody who sees that, that, that it's book four, and they might automatically go to book one. So I feel like trad publishing until very recently had to make each book a possible entry point because the old books would often not be on the shelf. And, you know, you'd kind of see a little more recapping of the previous ones than, you know, these days, I think you see less of that. But I'm, I'm curious, that always seems like a good idea to me. But I don't know how effective it really is. I know as a reader myself, every now and then there'll be a book bub. And it's like book nine in the Patricia Briggs series. I'm like, well, wait, book one is seven ninety nine. Book, You know, I might have tried book one. I'm not going to jump in at nine. I don't know, Andrea, I know you've got a, client, a lot of clients and stuff. Does anybody successfully doing that that you know of? Um, so like my flagship series is a 10 book series and I originally planned to have it two series. Um, so where book six was a new entry point, new series, new story arc and things like that. And I found that readers did not care. I couldn't get them to read book six, but I think Joe, were you saying like, like this is a new world that you've created a new universe and you could have multiple series in that? Or were you saying one series with multiple entry points? Uh, what I was thinking was one, I mean, this is a world that could have multiple series going on the way it's, it's pretty get by again, by the end of the third book, the, there's a pretty big thing going on. Uh, but I was thinking of still maintaining with the main, the same main characters. Uh, but again, if the series is well developed enough, I could just find a more interesting set of characters that would work too. Yeah. I mean, like my series, I, it's, I had, like I said, I had, I have three entry points into it. So book one, then book six, and then book 10 are all three entry points. And I wrote them all to be read separately from everything else. But readers don't care. They're like, I want to start with book one. You tell me which one is book one, and that's where I'll start. And so that that was a problem for me. I wish I hadn't done that personally. Instead, so what I've done since then, all of my series are still entry points into that world um, since then. So the series I'm writing right now is a new entry point into that world. And then the series I just finished is a new entry point. And that's worked a lot better for me. And they're roughly the same characters. So, you know, I just take the main character's love interest and write a series about that, or, you know, characters that are in that same world that readers are familiar with. And then like my 
that flagship series, that 10 book series, it's my flagship series because it's been out longer, but the one that follows it, that's a new entry point and it's a completely different standalone series. That one's probably going to be outselling it here pretty soon. So, um, that you might find that. And if it's a world you enjoy, then why not branch into a bunch of different series in it? You know? Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, my other comment was that for launching, this wasn't your discussion topic, but uh, you know, launching new books and long existing series, I think you might've already done this, but for anybody listening, you know, if you're up to five, six, seven in a series and it's been a while and you're having a hard time, getting sales on book one, you know, that's a good time to do the box set of books one through three. And if you are trying to get, those are wide series. And as you know, Joe, I'm not telling you anything new. If you're trying to get a book bub, they really seem to like, you know, the 999 box set discounted to 99 cents versus just, you know, here's something that's always permanently free book one advertising that. And I will say a book bub only has a one science fiction category too, and one fantasy category. It's really rare for them to subdivide things so i'm not surprised that they have, don't have a urban fantasy category i don't think that means there's not an audience for it i think you know uh, when data guy did it at least on amazon and he wasn't just looking at ku it was about twice the audience for urban fantasy as epic fantasy back when he did his report at sifwa in 2018 i think which is uh why so many people get great success in that in the fantasy category but also it's super competitive so i think that is a category where you know as we're finding if you're not really on the mark of what people want that it can be really easy to get lost all right can i make a quick comment right? yes really of course. so um yeah bookbub they i mean they've got lots of like split downs into their romance but the fantasy they usually only share epic fantasy so i'm like my fantasy series that are more mainstream, they accept all the time. They've never accepted one of my straight urban fantasy books. And so I don't understand why. I mean, maybe you guys would, but I mean, urban fantasy is a huge market on Kindle, you know, but can, if you follow BookBub, they very rarely share urban fantasy to their fantasy readers. Unless you're traditionally published, in which case they don't mind doing book nine in your series of <laughs> whatever. But yeah, I think that maybe just for whatever reason that their audience in particular is, you know, likes epic fantasy a little more. But sometimes, too, you get that confirmation bias when you maybe you're only looking at the email every other day and it just seems like the thing you think is happening <laughs> is happening because, you know, that's kind of what you're looking for the thing where you buy a new car and then you suddenly see that car everywhere and you're like, that car is the only car that's out there. But you know, so that's a possibility too. I don't know if anybody actually follows all the categories and breaks that down as to what they promote, but, but anyway, should we move on to Andrea? Do you do want to talk about what you're doing this year and if you have anything you want to discuss? Yeah. Um, and you guys can help me like, reduce the craziness that's in my brain right now, because it's actually something I've been struggling with is helping myself, just figuring out what to focus on. So writing's always the biggest thing, right? Um, so I've got a bunch of things set up for this year that are solid sets up setups, things that can't change because I've already got them up for pre-order. So that's four books in my Midnight Chronicles, and that's one every nine weeks. And then I've also started writing my Dragon series. Uh, and I've, I'm doing that with my co-writer, who is my me esposo. <laughs> I can't say he's my husband because we haven't technically announced that he's my co-writer. <laughs> so me esposo, <laughs> um, he, he'll be fine with that. But so I dictate about 10 minutes a day, which ends up being around 1500 words right now. And I hand that off to him. He revises, expands, etc. But I can't focus on it as much as I'd like because I'm working so hard on my Midnight Chronicles books. And the way I've got things set up for the Midnight Chronicles books has been working well. So I set it up where I'd have time to dictate while I'm in the writing period, um, 5,000 a day. And then I revise five single space pages a day during that revision period. And then I, you know, go through another revision set, which usually takes me a day or two. And then I hand that off to my editor. And that's been working really well, even while we've been in panic modes with baby having the flu and things like that. So that's working out. I think I'll be able to keep that up for a while um, without burning out. Um, but, and then I've got a lot of little side things that I'm trying to decide what I want to be focusing on. So one of them is, is a store to sell my like novellas and my short stories on that don't get as many downloads from retailers. And, um, and that'll be like a direct sell, um, type situation. And I'm also currently picking narrators for the books that, that, that the production company, uh, is, is producing for me. 
uh, we're having a hard time finding narrators for one of those books. And so that just keeps stalling over and over again. Um, and then I've also got, a, got plans to do a bunch of Kickstarter projects and those all, this all relates to each other. So my question basically is of all these things that I'm trying to focus on, what, where should I put my focus? Cause obviously writing needs to come first. That's what I always do first, but I mean, I need to be doing other things as well so that my business doesn't, I just need to be more well-rounded. Right. And so Kickstarter feeds into audiobooks because I plan to use Kickstarter to um, Kickstarter crowdsource my first couple of audiobooks after the production company does theirs. And the reason I'm struggling with that is I don't necessarily have the time to run something like that right now, but I have this company who wants to produce two of my audiobooks and that's a huge expense on their side and they're giving me free reign on everything and I don't want it to flop. I'm one of the first author, authors they picked for this new program. And so I'm like, I need to have other audiobooks out in order for those two audiobooks to make money. I don't want it to be a bad experience for them or for me, you know? And so I'm like, I need to get audiobooks out, but I also need to be doing, you know, more writing. And I've got my Patreon account, you know, and I haven't been able to do anything with Patreon for several months. Once I start writing novels, I can't do short stories as well. And this is, this is the problem with having children because, <laughs> because I can't, I mean, you guys know if you split your time too much and your attention too much, then you just do a whole bunch of things really poorly instead of doing one thing really well. So I'm like, I'm going to write, that's going to be my main thing, but excuse me, which of those side things should I focus on? I mean, the Patreon account that's has stuff going on or the, or the audio books or Andrea's choking herself over here, apparently. <laughs> but I mean, what are your guys' opinions on that? Well, let me just say that I don't have kids and that sounds like really ambitious and are really a lot of things you're thinking about and it makes me tired listening to it. So um, I would say, and interestingly with the audio books, I'm not sure that you should feel you have to put out audio books because you have other ones coming out. Actually, traditional publishers kind of hate when indies release stuff around the same time as they're releasing stuff because they believe you only want to publish once a year and everything gets into that. So they might actually make less if you know, you're kind of funneling your traffic toward two series that you have out there. If it's something you want to do anyway, that's fine. But I just, I don't feel, I mean, unless they've told you like, Hey, Andrea, you need to get your own audiobooks out here at the same time. Uh, is it like that or? No, it's what it is, is I'm not sure if I'm allowed to announce it or not, but it's a new program by, um, an actual distributor and one of the companies that they distribute to. And so it's not like an audiobook production company. It's a retailer basically who want to produce um, the first book in one series and the first book in another series. And I'm like, that's really cool. That's really exciting. But from what I, everything I've read and studied is if you only have one book in one series out, then you don't make as much money. And the way that they're letting me choose the price, they're letting me choose everything. And so I won't be making money on those books. Everything will go to them until those audiobooks pay back, you know, what they've put in to produce them. And then I'll be making 50% royalties after that. But I'm like, okay, so maybe I just don't need to worry about it. Maybe I don't need to take that upon myself, you know, whether or not those audiobooks fail, but aren't they kind of almost guaranteed to fail if there aren't any other books for readers to go to after? Are they going to want you to produce the following ones? Because usually they would want the right of first refusal and would forbid you from producing the following ones until they decide if they want it or not. Um, it's not like a traditional contract or anything like that. It's just, it's a program that is, it's for authors. Um, I can't, I'm not entirely sure how much I can say about it just because I haven't seen them announce it anywhere. I mean, I ran it past a couple of industry professionals and they're like, yes, it's a good deal. Yes, you should do it. But I haven't seen it announced anywhere and they hadn't either. Um, if they want to do, I mean, that's a good point. Maybe I shouldn't worry about um, I, but I'm trying to, I mean, building up my, my newsletter, my audio book followers, maybe I shouldn't worry about it. That's a good point. Cause if they, if it does do well, then they would want to do more in the series, I'm assuming. Right. Right. And then what you could do is we, you know, we had a book funnel on Damon mentioning the two hours you could record or have somebody record just a couple short stories that might help you with the promotion when those do come out. And that would be less money and time from your part, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, that's Joe, a good you, idea. Do you want to chime in on audiobooks? I have some thoughts on Kickstarter and Patreon too, but uh, yeah, on audiobooks, like it, I can understand what you're saying. Like in terms of like the success of an audiobook series and the overall earnings of audiobooks, they're not unlike uh, eBooks in that the longer the series and and you know read through and and funnel through and all that. 
But in any case, the first book is going to be the one that's going to have the highest, like there's like read through is not greater than 100%. So having books two and three out uh, uh, around the same time isn't necessarily going to increase the amount of money and earnings made by the first one. And if the first one is the one that they're sort of keeping an eye on, then if it's going to be, I don't think that books two and three are going to be, are going to affect the, uh, the, the, the earnings potential of book one. So from their point of view, I don't think books two and three are super duper important to have out. Like from your point of view, it will, it'll, especially if they're going to give a promotional push to book one and having books two and three out is going to help you uh, at that time. So you could think about it from that point of view. But I agree that I don't think from their point of view, books two and three, I don't think, I don't think, certainly don't think they're expecting it. And I don't, I don't think that they necessarily require it or will benefit from it. Uh, so f do it for you if you like, and if it's something you want to do. But if you're doing it to help uh, the, the program, which again, it's a, sp it's a very specific thing, so it's hard to tell for sure. But uh, I would say that it's not a huge priority to work on uh, on those other books right away. You guys are awesome. I feel better already. <laughs> All right, it's only thirty thousand for this mastermind class, so you know, we'll bill <laughs> hey, you. Where's in my cruise? Mon monthly installments. <laughs> Why aren't we on a on a ship somewhere on the ocean? <laughs> I don't know. We'll get to that next time. Um, and then for Patreon and Kickstarter, I actually. I think as we're recording this, it will come out after our Kickstarter interview with Lauren. So people will know why we're like all excited about Kickstarter again, is that we just talked to somebody who had some great ideas. And I've been thinking about it too. Um, I think I'm not gonna do it for my first urban fantasy series, but if the series does well, I think a spinoff series would be a good time to try Kickstarter because it would be a new spot for people to that are unfamiliar with it to maybe jump in. And also by that time, my readers would be super excited, hopefully, uh, to get involved in that. Whereas I feel like going in with a brand new series, although I did get a really good response on Facebook when I asked, asked on my author page, you know, I, I kind of thought people would be like, well, well, you don't make enough money. You, you trying to get hand out some Kickstarter, but everybody was really into the idea of getting like signed paperbacks and th things like that. Cause I don't do that uh, as a general rule uh, in part, just because of traveling and because it's work, you know, extra work that <laughs> doesn't really pay that well. So, you know, you, you can decide if that's something you want to focus on, but it is a lot of work and it's hard to say in that publishing category, what the upside potential is. You know, we've seen Michael J. Sullivan do tremendously well, but he's also got a really big audience. He started, he killed it as an indie back in like 2009, 2010. Then he got a traditional publishing deal and got audience, you know, so he's got a really big audience. And, you know, we lesser peeps, <laughs> you know, we might get 10 or $20,000 and then you have to weigh like, is, is that worth all the work you put into it? Plus realizing that like he just made a hundred thousand, but he also has to send out like 1100 signed paperbacks. So how much he actually has after buying all those author copies and paying for shipping is something to consider whenever you see somebody that did have a big Kickstarter, uh, that's their gross, not necessarily what they're putting in their pocket afterwards. So if like, if it's fun and it sounds good to you, go for it. But I, I think you shouldn't, I probably focusing on the writing is more, I'm not going to say a guaranteed income, but I, it would be for me. That's why I have to weigh against. I know I'd make more just, you know, rapid releasing a new series into KU. And the, so that's why I have to weigh it against that, you know? Yeah, no, it is a guaranteed income. <laughs> it's like I know about how much I'll make when I release a new book. Um, in my Kickstarter, I, I'm scared. I wouldn't do a publishing category because I've I've had friends that have done really well but yeah I, I would do more like games based on my series you know and I've got I've I've talked to my readers and that's excited them ex exponentially very much and I'm like um just to do a card game is only like three hundred dollars you know and I could actually see myself doing that but like you said it's a lot of work to organize and and you know a lot of excitement you have to maintain for a whole month and I'm like I, I just want to be writing you know I'm excited I would love to have my book made into a a game, but I just, I want to be writing. <laughs> no, I understand because I've had the same thought. I'm like, I could do a card game about my dragon series, but you know, there's a lot of work that goes into that too. You have to, I think if you're not a huge gamer yourself and haven't done games before, and then you're going to need to bring in friends to play test and all that stuff. So it's like, it's a lot of work that maybe is not apparent just from first glance. Cause I've had that thought too, like I could just do a card game. How could that, how hard could that be? You know, I'll just make the next exploding kittens, but it'll be exploding dragons. Uh, Joe, do you have want to chime in on Patreon? Cause I know you do something similar with the short stories. 
Uh, yeah, I like Patreon. I never, I never had Patreon set up as a, as a primary earner. It was a sort of, I write short stories as a byproduct of my writing process, because if I start to get burnt out on something, then I'll take a weekend to write a short story. I don't know that I would have started. Well, also the Patreon was going to be used as a way to do pre-sales of the Kindle exclusive stuff. I don't know that I would have started one if not for the fact that I already had a, you know, a, a giant pile of things that I was going to produce. In fact, now I'm at the end of that pile of things. So I'm looking at having to, uh, you know, add short story writing into my process again to keep it going, but I'm not too concerned about it. So uh, I think Patreon has got tremendous potential if it's, if it becomes a focus, but I don't know, like I would probably put it low on my priorities list. Um, and again, in my specific pipeline, I would have removed it from my, from my, uh, from my earnings if I didn't already have that as like, a, a, again, as a way to use a byproduct of my normal process. I try to put very little effort into Patreon, just use it as a passive add-on. Um, so that's just what I would do. And, and I don't know how I would recommend that you use it. If how it's going to be a lot of effort. How often do you release things on Patreon as that by side project thing? Uh, I do a short story or a novella once a month on the same day every month. Uh, okay. And I had 13 of them uh, in the hopper before I even started. So I technically haven't had to put a moment of work into it except for commissioning. Like once I pass a certain earnings threshold, I said that I would put illustrated covers. So aside from actually doing the legwork to get the stuff edited and put covers on them, it's like two hours of work uh, outside of what I was already doing. And it's earning me just shy of 150 bucks a month, which is just about enough to cover the cover and the edit. So I don't particularly, it's just a thing, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so also I have I would, to, I would sorry, just what? say about the, about the Kickstarter too, like um, everything that Lindsay said makes a lot of sense. The, I would also say that knowing how to run a Kickstarter successfully is a skill uh, and it's a worthwhile skill. So if it's something you want to do, even if maybe it's not going to be a huge earner by itself or isn't maybe necess necessary for your, your publishing or pipeline or anything like that, if you get good at it, that's something that's worth being good at. So I would say give it a shot at least once and see how it is. Because again, if you have a knack for it, then it could certainly become a very valuable part of your business going forward. And I, I don't want to discourage anyone from Kickstarter either. Like I was surfing through, you know, after we had that interview to see who in the publishing category actually had done well. And there were quite a few folks that had made like 20 or 25,000. There were not like, I wouldn't consider them big names at all. Like most, a lot of them I didn't really know. So they were hustling somewhere to, to make it work or they just put together really good campaigns. I noticed the ones that flopped tended to be like, they were asking a lot of money for not that much. Like here's ten dollars. I want ten dollars for just the ebook, and it's like, well, you want to give somebody a better deal than they would get buying it on Amazon. Generally, like, or some a whole bunch of bonus extra stuff that they can't get anywhere else. So I'm keeping that all in mind too, because I I do want to do one someday. I, I think there is a little potential to maybe reach some readers you don't otherwise reach, and to get out of that Amazon ecosystem reliance too. Um, I would probably just do it pre-launching books that I'd already written and was going to release anyway. So at least as far as creating the products, I wouldn't be making a whole lot of extra work for myself. It'd be, you know, here's the audiobook and files and here's the eBooks. The only thing is when you ship paperbacks that does, I can't even imagine having to go sign 1100 paperbacks. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I guess we can move on to my stuff. If you guys are happy to keep going. So for me in 2020, I'm going to finish, I have two novels in my Star Kingdom sci-fi series that I, I kind of put aside to get an urban fantasy series started, but I, I'm writing seven and I, I'm pretty sure everything will finish up with eight. And one thing I want to do is I have a 9.99 box set of books one through three that I have not wanted to discount this soon. I released the first book in May. So people very recently paid full price for those first three books. So I, I always hate as a person who follows book by myself when I see something that's dropped to 199 that like two months ago released and they actually do this. I don't know what trad publishing is thinking like they're trying to goose the bad launch or something but they drop it from 999 to 199 really early on and I've talked to a lot of readers that that really ticks them off and they're like well maybe I won't buy book two in the series until book club comes out where it's 199 but so about the time I release the eighth and final one, I think will be 
time to take a shot at that. Those are all in KU, so I don't know if I'll be able to get a book bub on that box set, but maybe this summer we'll look into that. Um, so the thing I was going to ask, bring up for discussion is that, as I've been talking about, I've, I've now written the first three novels in a new urban fantasy series, and I'm working on a actually editing up a short story, short story of 12,700 words, possibly called a novelette, to put up on my blog as a freebie so I can email the fantasy list before I actually launch the series and give them, you know, something to get excited about and something for free before I ask them like, hey, you want to buy stuff? And I originally was thinking of doing a background story uh, since it would take place before, you know, prequel, short story. But I kind of decided since all the characters meet in the first book, uh, any background story will be more interesting after readers have read at least the first book. Because until then, they're going to, you know, I think it's more the relationship between the, the two main characters that's going to make people want to read it. So I decided to do a short story slash novelette that um, sort of plays up the relationship and that I think will entice people, hopefully, that want to get into it. And this does mean jumping ahead in the timeline, so I'll have to put a spoiler warning or something on that post. But um, I think as a reader, that would be most likely, I would be most likely to be drawn in by a promise of like the, the romance, as in this case, you know, rather than two random background stories before the characters have met each other. So that's my current plan, um, is doing free stuff. And then I plan on doing another background novella story to entice people onto the newsletter. Uh, so at that point, they'll have read the book one, and then they will hopefully care about how, where the magical tiger came from, which, uh, you know, they may not care about otherwise. Then my plans are just to basically, you know, get the sponsored posts with, you know, spread out over the first couple of weeks of the release. And I should say, I don't have artwork for this series yet. So this is still a couple months off. I started it as because I needed a break from my sci-fi but it's hard not to plan for stuff. It's probably good to plan for stuff. And then of course, Amazon ads targeting, you know, I'll probably put the pre-order up a week or two before the release of book one and not mention it to anybody, but just target, you know, the urban fantasy authors that I think my books will be similar to so that maybe I can get in some also bots for other authors in the genre before my regular also bots come in and screw it up. And <laughs> it ends up done with all these sci-fi books and on the pages for sci-fi books. That's not ideal as we've talked about, but that's just something that happens naturally if you genre hop and you have an audience that will buy everything. <laughs> it's like a good problem to have, but it does kind of confuse the algorithms on Amazon apparently. So my question for you guys, is there anything else I should be doing as someone who's basically coming into a really competitive subgenre of fantasy that I haven't written in before? Um, well, first off, uh Obviously, you know, you know well enough what you should be doing to, to make sure that you're hitting the tropes and that you're visually like the, 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 the cover is matching what people are expecting and all that. So obviously, uh, our, our listeners might need an update on that, but certainly not you. The cover should look like an urban fantasy cover and the blurb should read like an urban fantasy blurb. But um, you're excellent at writing characters and banter. And I think it's definitely a good bet that if you give people a character short to establish that they can expect more banter and stuff like they're, they're, they're hoping for, then you're going to get a lot of your original readers to follow you. Uh, if you're worried that some of the folks who like your fantasy or like your other stuff, we'll, we'll focus on fantasy because urban fantasy is obviously going to be most similar to fantasy. Uh, if you're worried that they're not going to follow you over because they're specifically in it for fantasy elements and aren't necessarily urban fantasy readers, uh, it might be worth like either in one of these stories or in some other way, bringing some of the more fantastic elements to the forefront uh, so that people can see right up, right off the bat, like here are the fantasy elements in addition to the character work, which you know I'm going to be able to do. Here's this, the fantasy stuff. So that, like, if you like this stuff in a fantasy story, it's going to be in this story too. The me being me, the way I would typically do that is to, is to commission some, some creature or character illustration. Uh, people have come to expect that from me. I have a whole cabinet full of, uh, of figures for that purpose. So, uh, yeah, I would say, I would, again, the thing is, I feel the thing that's going to differentiate you as starting off in this new genre is that you have such a strong following and fairly, a fairly diverse uh, group of genres. So bring, bring over the people who already like you is going to be a big part of giving you a good launch. And I think, again, if you're going to do uh, shorts that involve the characters, fantastic, that covers that. 
my only uh, uh, addition would be making sure that people know what sort of fantasy stuff they'll get. Yeah, I, I found it is very interesting in the urban fantasy category as far as covers, it's almost always a person. I'm like, ah, oh, I got this awesome dragon, but I better, you know, kind of go with what's normal. Although I'm doing illustrated and I think that's not that normal. It's a very Photoshop manipulation heavy genre. And that may just be that the ones I'm seeing uh, in the top 100 uh, in KU on Amazon are rapid release kind of authors putting books out quickly. So as I'm finding, I write books faster than illustrators can make me covers. So this is something I've struggled with often in fantasy. But you know, kind of wanting, I love illustrated covers. Don't you guys love it when your, your characters Absolutely, are really I represented? <laughs> yes, but it's, it's a struggle. I, the sci-fi has been easier because there's a couple uh, cover artists that really can do a nice job with the spaceship, you know, battle scene kind of stuff. And they're pretty quick and really reliable. I'm still looking for quick and reliable in fantasy. And I, quick is hard to find. And I understand it's a lot of work. You know, I'm not just diminishing that hopefully but I, I it's a struggle you know like if there's I feel like it's waiting for an artist out there to really become a killer popular cover art designer because that's happened in sci-fi these two uh Tom Edwards and Jeff Brown you see their covers all over the top 100 in like the space opera category um but yeah uh Andrea did you I'll I'll stop rambling since you guys are supposed to be chiming in now <laughs> Um, so, I mean, my thoughts are, are pretty similar to Joe's. Um, you, you know what kind of what to expect because you've been doing this for a long time. You, you know what needs to happen. Um, I don't think you need to worry, obviously, about uh, switching subgenres. You're, a lot of readers won't follow, but m many will. And you have a large enough fan base where the ones who do follow will give you momentum that'll help you make a pretty big splash, a decent splash, maybe not necessarily a huge splash, but a big enough splash for you to gain momentum there. And since I know you plan on releasing regularly, you'll put yourself up towards the top pretty quickly or the bottom, whatever. I hate that whole number one is at the bottom. It's, it's at the top. Okay. <laughs> um, but like, um, so yeah, so the genre you're switching to, they love Kindle Unlimited books that are released frequently. And it's going to be, honestly, it's going to be kind of fun, exciting to see what happens. Um, will probably be in like no time at all, like seven months from now. And you'll be like, yeah, I'm now like number one on, on a uh, urban fantasy. Um, but something I'd keep in mind, just urban fantasy readers, they like things that come quickly. And so with your short story, don't give it to them too far in advance. Not the short story, the, the novel that you were talking about. Uh, one thing my readers that that's really upset them is when I get them excited about a book that's not coming out for two or three weeks, which I'm like, that's ridiculous. You guys should be more patient. But they're like, I want this now. And if you can't get it to me now, then don't talk about it. Um, and I, I still talk about things, but I mean, it depends. I mean, how, how um, far in advance are you planning on giving them that novelette on your website? You make a good point. And I was thinking of putting it up earlier, although I was also thinking of doing a Kickstarter, so it wouldn't have been that much before that. But I, like I said, I might wait till the second series to try that. So you're probably right that it would make sense to put it up only like a week or at the most two weeks ahead of time so they don't read it and then forget about the characters. <laughs> Either that or do a series of short stories, but that's that's a lot of work and I still have book seven in the sci-fi. I have to get out there too before the the, the readers are like, wait a minute, what are these other fantasy things doing coming up? We're waiting for book seven. So I got to at least have the pre-order for that up before I launch the new series. And I just did that. I did the a, a series of short stories leading up to this big launch I did. And the excitement came right around the first two short stories. And then it kind of petered off. They're like, okay, this is great. Now I want the actual story. So, so I'm like, well, I've got the rest of that. It's like a basic little mini series. You know, it's a serial technically because they're shorter and they and cliff ender and cliff hender cliff hanger <laughs> and endings. I'm not a public speaker. Okay. I'm a writer <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, so, and then I, I liked the length that you picked. 12,000 words is fantastic. Um, my readers, that's where they like things to be is between, I've had like 2,000 words that have worked really, really well, but urban fantasy readers tend to like shorter stuff. And so the teasers I give them, I tend to make them between two and 15,000 words. And then my novels are usually like 50,000 words and that's made them very happy. I know 60,000 would make them happy as well, but <laughs> readers are picky. <laughs> It is something to remember too, if 
you know, that's a good point. Like if you're putting it on your blog too, there's a limit to how much, how long you want it to be. Like I'll probably break this over like three blog posts. So it ends up being, you know, three times 4,000 or something. Um, Cause I think people will read more if they have the ebook on their e-reader, but you know, how long do people actually want to sit and read at the screen? I, I'm laughing when you said number one in urban fantasy, cause I don't think I'm enough. To, I can't write to market as we've discussed. I, usually hate whatever's popular, but I did try to at least read enough books out there to, to like think I'm probably in the ballpark at least, but I know my, my heroine's in her forties. That alone will be like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> they have to be 18 or new adults or something. And you know, it, so we'll see. I, I'm just hoping that I can do well enough. It'd be nice to be able to at least rank in the top 100 for a while, at least while I'm doing the new you know, series, it is a lot more competitive than like space opera and uh, even epic fantasy, I think is maybe about 4,000 overall in the store gets you in the top 100, but I think you have to be under 2,000 overall in the store to get that poor urban fantasy category is mingled in with paranormal romance. So it really, it's kind of hard to even look at stuff and, and see what, which is which and detangle it. <laughs> All right, if you guys don't have any more masterminding thoughts that you want to do, shall we move on to our mistakes? Sure. All right, Joe, you're number one here on the, on the am, notes. I am number one at mistakes. I, I only gave two here, but I, we could do an entire episode on Joe mistakes. I, I have a whole file of them. But uh, I'm going to start with like an early mistake I made and was I didn't have a plan for if I succeeded. Uh, I didn't anticipate success of any form. So all of my research regarding my first release went into the nuts and bolts of actually getting into the stores. I only cared about logistics. I wanted to know how to format my file and what distributors I should be using and stuff like that. I didn't think about what I would do if the book sold and, uh, and like what I would do when they sold. I certainly, I was not, I was not planning that far ahead. So my books weren't professionally edited at the time. They were as good as I could make them because I didn't want to invest the money to make them better because I figured I would lose that money. They didn't have a professionally made cover. I had a homemade cover. And I obviously solved both of those problems once I started making money. But the, I think the biggest mistake in all of that, and it was one that was understandable because this information wasn't widely available in 2010 when I started, I didn't have a newsletter. I didn't have a link to a newsletter. So when I first got picked up, uh, by a website called Pixel of Ink, and I mysteriously got 25,000 downloads on, on my permafree. There was no way for those people to, to stay in touch with me besides, you know, maybe going to my blog, but they would have to search for the name of the book. I didn't even really have that set up very well. So, uh, yeah, I did not have a plan for what I would do if my book was successful. And as a result, I probably lost 90% of the people who really liked that first book when I didn't have the second one out already. And I didn't have any way for them to stay in touch with me to find out about the new releases. So that was a gigantic mistake early on that I think really hurt the, the next two or three years of my career. Should we discuss Joe's mistake before we move on to somebody <laughs> else's mistake or just rattle them off? Yeah, Joe, I can't believe you did that. That was horrible. I'm dumb. Is that the kind of disgusting you mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like a, not a bad thing, but it's almost rough when somebody has early success and then they're not ready for it. I feel like that's really common. Like I would have been blown away <laughs> if, you know, I sold a lot of those early books. So I don't know. So if you haven't had super success yet, but you're slowly learning all the things you should be doing, you know, hopefully gradually selling more over time, you're probably in a decent place. But yeah, so I actually got my newsletter going pretty early and the Facebook page, but there, my covers and stuff also were not great in the beginning. It, it was a lot harder to find people early on to, like my editor came out of freelance editing uh, for technical stuff. <laughs> so, um, Andrea, did you want to say anything or jump into your mistakes? Um, um, I don't know. I already mocked Joe for making mistakes. So <laughs> I'll just go ahead and go into mine if that's okay. Um, okay. So yeah, talking about mistakes we made early on, um, one of the biggest mistakes I made in the beginning was listening to professionals in the industry. So I had, I went to this class put on by this, she's still a pretty big industry professional and I still hear her giving really bad advice <laughs> to people. Um, her advice when I told her I was writing a middle grade novel and I told her it was about 90,000 words long, she says you need to cut about 70,000 words out of that. 
And so I did. I took that to the very, 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 very bare minimum thinking this is not right. This is wrong. This is not right. But she said I needed to do that. And when I signed with the publisher, my new editor told me that I needed to put it all back in because middle grade fantasy books are a lot longer than regular fantasy. So like Harry Potter, you know, all of those books are a lot longer than 20 to 30,000 words long. And so, um, but by that point, it was like a year and I'd already changed the story enough where things were no, things no longer matched up. So the character was older in the shortened version and um, the publisher, um, they were like, don't worry about that. We're going to, we'll fix it and we'll fix it as we're editing. But the problem is we didn't fix it as we were editing. And so we had to make the character be younger, but because the story was st still slightly older, we made the character be 14 instead of 12. And the publisher's like, this is a middle grade fantasy. So we made the character be 14, but it never, it didn't, it didn't jive. Like readers of that age, middle grade readers usually read books about 12 year olds, you know? And so when I was trying to market it, the middle grade readers were like, this doesn't, this is too old. This, this, this is for my older brother. This, it was just really, really hard to market. And so when I relaunched that series, I did rewrite it as a 16 year old, which is where I wanted it to be in the, you know, from the beginning almost, but, and that's done a lot better. Uh, but apparently because that was the mistake of my publisher and not my own mistake, I went and made that same mistake again <laughs> with my next series. And my next series, I, my problem with this one was I didn't re I didn't, understand the tropes before I started writing it. And so I thought that an 18 year old would be a, an adult in a fantasy because, you know, 18 is the legal age to be an adult. Right. But when I pulled my readers after that series had been out for a while and I was like, what is going on? Um, I asked them, I'm like, what age are characters in adult novels generally? And they're like, well, in order for me to consider it to be an adult novel, the character needs to be in her thirties. And I said, well, what about a 25 year old? And they're like, yeah, I'd still put that too young. And I'm like, 25 is not YA, but that's, this is around the time when the new adult genre started becoming popular. And so that series is about an 18 year old and it's not quite young adult. It's not quite adult and it's not, and, um, not new adult because it's not, it's not a romance, you know? And so that's a mistake I made with that series was not researching the age that my character needed to be before I started writing. And this series is my flagship series. It has made a ton of money for me, but my readers, like when I ask them, I'm like, what kind of, what kind of fantasy do you think this is? Half of them say it's young adult and half of them say it's adult. And so I'm like, and if my readers don't know where to put me, I don't know where to put me. Websites don't know where to put me. And so my thing with that is make sure you understand what you're writing <laughs> before you uh, put a lot of time into marketing. And then, I mean, and again, I don't write to market like, you know, most authors don't. And it has sold for me, but I think if I had known how to target even just the age, it probably would have done better for me initially. That is something I learned after I wrote my middle grade stories, the same thing that usually kids read up a couple years. They want to read about kids that are a little older. So like if you were shooting for that fifth grade you know, 10 year old, you'd probably want the 12 year old character. And that, you know, I think it does get fuzzy if you're sort of in between the expectations. Um, you said middle girl, middle grade fantasy is supposed to be longer than fantasy. Did you mean other middle grade genres? Cause yes, yes. Okay, other okay. middle grade. Yeah. Like real this life is middle clarify. grade. Is <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, Cause that's what I, I think the first Harry Potter book is not as long, but it's, it's still, like 75,000 words yeah. long. And then later ones are like over a hundred thousand. <laughs> once you make it, the publisher doesn't care, you know, once you're selling piles. But so I feel like I look to it, what agents wanted and yeah, you know, it was shorter for middle grade, but you're, I met that makes sense that fantasy would allow a little more than, you know, babysitters club or whatever. <laughs> Um, what else was I going to say? Yeah, new adult is kind of a confusing genre. I see sometimes in fantasy people flagging stuff as new adult, but I feel like it's more contemporary so far. Like you said, a lot of romance. It will, you know, and it tends to be that college age, I, I think, of as new adult. And then in sci fi and fantasy, good luck even finding someone over 30. That can be a challenge. Sci fi is not so bad, but uh, fantasy, I don't know, especially urban fantasy, everything I picked up, they're like 22. I was like, I would like to read about older characters, so I'm going to write one. <laughs> We will see if that's my downfall. Um, Joe, did you have any thoughts on that? Just that uh, it's funny how occasionally two mistakes can offset each other and, and wipe out the issue. Because I had similarly had an issue where my the my epic fantasy I wasn't targeting any specific age range. I, I it was written way before I had any concept of doing that sort of thing. But I ended up also being fairly vague about how old she was. Like, there is no specific mention of how old she is in the book. 
And I think that helped me just sort of skate across the issue of whether this should be a new adult or, or young adult or all that, because with the exception of the cover art, which is still some of the most evocative cover art that I have, people love that character illustration, you really don't know how old this person is besides that they are old enough to be living independently. And it's one of those where if I had been a little bit smarter, I would have been explicit in their age. And if I had been a lot smarter, I would have been, I would have been explicit in their age as the correct age. So the, the, my own innocence kept me from tripping over that middle step of choosing the wrong age. All right, for a mistake from me, I think early on I made a lot of decisions based on my own preferences as a reader slash consumer. You know, I was like, I'm only going to send out emails when I do a new release because I don't like getting pestered by emails a lot. And, uh, you know, I was like, oh, I'm going to go with a blurb that's kind of ha ha funny rather than epic fantasy, serious, sounding cool and emphasizing the, you know, the characters, the assassin and that kind of thing. And I found out later on that ha ha funny doesn't really work as well as at least in that genre as hitting on the elements of epic fantasy that might be appealing to that crowd in general. Uh, humor in the books can work great, but I didn't find that a funny blurb was that well received in that genre. And I, it'll be interesting going into urban fantasy because I see a lot more funny blurbs in urban fantasy and you expect that snark a little more. So I, I will give it, <laughs> give it a shot again. But I just, there's a lot of things where, you know, I think it's okay to have gut feelings and, and hopefully your gut tells you the right thing. But I found a lot of times that I was wrong. I was not representative of my target, even readers who are like me. You know, I, we always feel with email, we hate email. We never sign up for other authors' email lists unless it's to spy on them. But, you know, sometimes readers love getting your emails. You're like their favorite author or one of their favorites. And it's really exciting for them to hear from you. So I, I think Andrea, would, as a newsletter person herself, would agree that more newsletters is probably good and a good way to establish a rapport rather than less. Although I, I still don't do it because now I get enough responses from the emails that I have to really decide if the time I will spend replying to the replies is, you know, going to be worth it because I'm doing a leading up to a book launch or something. So, but I think early on, I wish I just got in the habit of the monthly emails and done a little more split testing with, you know, in as much as it was possible with blurbs and covers and that kind of thing, because I just assumed that I knew what my readers wanted because I would be one of my readers. And that was not usually the case. <laughs> I, think think that's, have thoughts? <laughs> I think that's definitely like, I also struggle with that constantly. I still struggle with that. I, I, the problem is you don't often know that the way you feel about something is not representative of the rest of your audience. Like it, it, it's, it's very difficult to determine which ways you feel uh, are right and which are wrong. And it's also, but you also run the issue of like, uh, like Andrea had said, where she took a piece of advice that turned out to be bad advice early on. So you, you uh, like I, something that I end up getting stuck in a loop on is I'm not a hundred percent sure um, what I should be focusing on as, well, what is the good advice or when is my gut correct? So I completely understand uh, where you are with that. Um, and I, I was just going to say that, um, yeah, like my, my gut, I read pretty much every single genre. And so when I wrote my, my series initially, they were every single genre, you know, so I had romance and mystery and crime and and that's not exactly what readers look for. Like a lot of readers will only read the genre they love. They don't branch out of that. And I found a lot of authors read everything. Absolutely. Um, all right. So I got another mistake I'm going to talk about here, and that is lack of focus. Um, I've talked about it before. I talk about it a lot. If I had stuck, like I have three main series, which are all about five books in. And that's over the course of, I mean, I've got other books outside of those, but over the course of 10 years, that's, that's, that's three series that have gotten five books long. And if I had done that concurrent, like if I had done books one through five of one series and then moved on to another, I really think that that would have been better because I would have been released them, I've been able to release them more rapidly as it was for most of my career. Like the first few years of my career, I wasn't a full-time writer. I was barely doing one book uh, per year. Once I finally went full time, I was able to do three books per year. I may as well only have been doing one book per year because I was doing one book in each of those series per year. So if I had fans of individual series, I wasn't doing anything resembling a rapid release for them. It was an annual release for them. So a big mistake I feel like I made early on was just not focusing on building momentum on a single thing. I was jumping around too much. 
deluded my audience a little bit. My also bots have never been in any way representative of a single genre because they're always being released a bunch uh, amid a bunch of other stuff. So uh, I feel like, uh, I mean, and that's just lack of focus in terms of focusing on a single genre. Also lack of focus in terms of actually being able to focus on the work. Like I am a full-time writer, but I, when I added eight hours additional writing to my schedule by quitting my day job, I did not get eight hours of additional writing to my schedule because I found myself incapable of devoting that level of focus for a long time. And I still struggled to hit like five hours on a good work day. So just in general, a big mistake I have is failing to maintain focus. Is that five hours of writing a day? Because that's a lot of writing a day. Well, like five, basically it's the four hour chunk uh, of book biz, writing, lunch, book biz, writing. Like I don't, I can't get five hours of writing done a day. I get maybe three hours of actual solid writing and I don't get as many words as I should out of that because even when it's solid writing time and I'm doing like a, a 1200 words an hour, which is about what I do when I'm, when I'm in a solid writing, that's not a bunch because I will just sit there and like, even though I've outlined, I won't, I'll, I won't take the time to like have my, okay, here's my schedule. Yeah, here's what I'm going to write for today. Like I don't do the prep work up front. So 10 years of, of independent writing, I still don't have my pipeline as streamlined as it should be. It's a lot better today than it was 10 years ago, but good heavens, like focus is such a, such a mistake I continue to trip over. I think a lot of authors and artists and creative people are like that in general. I mean, I'm pretty good about getting the words in when I'm writing, but there's definitely days where it's just easier to maybe do like I might do five hours. To the, you know, even though it's not five in a row, right? It's it'll be split up snacks and dog walks in there. Cause it's hard to just create you know, we don't think about it as being hard, but it, I think you use a lot of calories making your little brain whir on the hamster wheel up there. And I, I certainly know about hopping genres. And it took me a while to figure out that for me, it's better to focus on one series from start to completion, which I am not doing right now. And I'm regretting, not regretting it, but there were reasons I needed a break from the sci-fi. But I, even now I can see that it's getting harder for me to uh, go back and finish the old stuff because I'm more excited about the new stuff. And I think that's a very typical writer thing to be like, I'm more excited about the shiny new idea I'm not working on than what I am working on. So at least you're not alone. <laughs> we, I think we all struggle with that. Go ahead, Andrea. Yeah, and I was going to say, um, I, I don't jump from genre to genre. I uber focus on one or genre sub uh, series to genre, series. I uber focus and then get just frustrated that I can't do it as fast as I want. And I generally blame it on my kids. But honestly, when I didn't have kids, I was a lot less productive and I had a hard time focusing. And so, yeah, it's, it's not easy. Um, so I'm going <laughs> to, this is funny because this is a new mistake I made <laughs> this next one. Um, this last book launch, the whole thing, that whole series, the whole book, all of it. No, just kidding. Not, not all of it, <laughs> but that book launch itself was, did end up being a mistake. I should not have put so much time and energy and even money into it as I did. Um, a lot of it was the timing on my life. I did just have a baby and that does make a difference. Um, even though I'm like, I just had, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm super woman. I can handle it. I have a baby. I've, I've had two other babies before, but every baby's different and different things floored me. And I should have, if my baby had been about the age he is now, or maybe a, a year old or whatever, I could have pulled it off. But with the timing, I, I just, I was not able to pull off my plans. And so what I planned to do originally was launch in October and rapid release three books at a time, you know, right at one, right after the other. But I didn't calculate in all the problems we were going to have with my baby with his health problems, his surgeries and his allergies and things like that. And so I wrote that first book, but I wasn't able to write the next book as fast as I wanted or needed to have a rapid release. And so I ended up putting that book releasing in October and then releasing the next book two months later. And what I should have done was release that first book as soon as it was ready. Um, because then that way it could have been up making money, getting reviews and things like that while I was writing the next book. Um, but I hadn't released in, in a new book in, in two months. And so putting it that far out ended up being a, um, a bad idea for me. It was like moving cold hard to get people to download, even though they're active and they love my books. I mean, I generally have a hard time getting my readers to switch to new series with me as it is. But if I'd had it set up the way I planned, it would have gone a lot better than it did. Um, 
anyway, so yeah, I should have released the first book when it was re- when it was ready, and then released the next book when it was ready instead of planning a rapid release that I couldn't possibly write quickly enough for. And so if I'd kept with my usual method, which is a book every three months, I probably would have done just fine. But instead I waited 10 months, which ended up being a big mistake. Um, And then another thing I learned through that whole entire launch series thingy was that um, newsletter swaps and urban fantasy seem to have run their course. I did it. I did newsletter swaps like a year ago, two years ago, and I get tons of downloads. And this time I swapped with 75 authors and some of them had some huge lists. And, um, I, I promoted with big websites at the same time and I ran Facebook and Amazon ads and I only got a thousand downloads on that book. And so, and judging by how things were lined up, I knew that those downloads did not come from the newsletter swaps. They came, a lot of them came from the big websites and my Facebook ads and things like that. And so I found that each Newsletter swap only got me one or two downloads, which was unfortunate because I did swap with some really big authors in the genre. Um, But anyway, so what ended up being was a lot of work for very little results. And I put a lot of time and energy into it when I could have been focusing more on just writing. And that's always been my motto. This is my first big new book launch, you know, for a first and a new series. I usually do, will do a book launch on the last book in the series and then focus all my effort on the first book in that series. And so I learned that I don't like big launches. I've never liked big launches. I've, I've made more money on a promotion on a book that's been out for a long time rather than on a book that's new. And that's just me. I know, I know a lot of authors actually make really good money off of their launches, but anyway, Um, But the good thing about those newsletter swaps is I did make a whole bunch of new friends with authors and I'm very excited to work with them in the future. So that part was pretty fantastic. Well, now I know I won't do newsletter launches for my (laughs) newsletter swaps for my epic, or I don't even know what I'm writing now. We're an hour into the show. (laughs) Urban fantasy. Um, No, I, I think that it's a lot of it is to how many newsletters authors are sending out and how many books they're mentioning in each one. Like the, Evan from Story Origins, you know, we talked about that. Some people are like, here's a whole list of books you should try because I'm obligated to return the swap that these people gave me. And uh, I don't know how to get around that. It's tough because a lot of people are just, that's what we're doing now to sell books. And um, I think I will probably just put that time and investment into advertising right now because I always feel a little weird plugging other people's books that I haven't read to my own list because they always take them as recommendations. So it's hard to you know, wrestle with like what you know could possibly sell books versus wanting to be, you know, the kind of person that you like to be to your readers, provide them the kind of content that you know that they'll enjoy. Um, Not to say that people who do newsletter swaps are necessarily doing that, but just if they're doing like 10 books in one newsletter every week that are just kind of randomly assorted in there, I can see why especially that wouldn't be as effective. And I don't know if that's what people were doing with yours. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't, it's hard to be like, Hey, can you make sure my book's the only book you talk about? You know, I mean, put it at the top (laughs) and that's what I do with them. I mean, I don't put it at the top, but I don't swap with more than one or two authors a week because I've noticed that my readers don't click as frequently if there's more than even two books. And so I try not to, you know, make things too busy for my readers because I'm trying to, I want to give value to the authors who swapped with me as well. And so my swap schedule, I'm going to be telling readers about my books or other people's books for all the way through May or even, or not May, February and March and everything. And is your dog done bothering you now, Lindsay? (laughs) They're getting restless. It's getting on towards dog dinner time. But um, (laughs) I did also want to say that one of the things I've realized having done numerous series launches now is that sometimes it's hard to tell in advance what's going to hit. And if it's not going to be a hit, you can put as much effort into it as you want and get so X many of downloads, but then it's not going to stick and get anything organic. And if it's sometimes it's something you didn't put as much effort into becomes that one that kind of hits and just really takes off without a lot of effort. So I don't know what the answer it is because it's hard to tell in advance, but I, I know for advertising now, I'm kind of seeing how well a book does on, you know, X dollars before committing to like, let's really throw a lot of money in this because I like with my sci-fi series, I thought that one was really I, I couldn't spend as much money as I wanted and it didn't convert as well. Like I think it's a, it was a, just a little out there for a lot of readers. Whereas the uh, box set I talked about with the dragon on the front, you know, that was really easy to spend a lot of money on ads and actually make enough money from the page reads that it like was very successful. So, but it's kind of hard to know. Sometimes you can guess, 
but you know I've certainly seen people do like two series that look pretty similar in the same genre and one is really successful and one just doesn't take off as much and it's I don't know I would just say before you commit to 75 newsletter swaps I don't know maybe see how it goes see how the first week goes but yeah we I've certainly made that mistake too like I, I always think like this is going to be the one you know and it's it's not um, Joe, did you want to comment on that anymore before I go into the last thing we're going to talk about? My last mistake I'm going to share. <laughs> um, just it, what's fr particularly frustrating about the, the, the mistakes you've described is that one of them is I was trying something new and it didn't work out the way I'd expect it to. And then another was I tried something that had worked for me before and it didn't work as well as it had in the past. And, and also combining with what you're talking about, what can be really frustrating, uh, especially in this, I'm sure every business, but this is the business I'm in is it's very hard to tell if the thing that you tried isn't worth doing or just didn't work this time. And that, like, that, again, is the sort of thing that will get my brain stuck in a circle where it'll be like, was this just not the, this just wasn't the series. This series was never going to succeed. I did everything right. And if I do this on the next series, it will work. Or was it, I did something wrong. This would have been the series if I did something right. Like hindsight isn't as useful as I wish it was sometimes because you don't know what exactly the failure was. So like that is a, a type of mistake that will like keep me up at night sometimes. Yeah. And I do plan on doing a relaunch with this series. Um, like, and just part of it is the reason I'm more successful in older books is because it's had time to find its audience. And so I know where to put the push, you know? And so this is the first time, like I said, that I've actually put a heavy push on a new book and yeah, like I can do a relaunch on it in a year and put new covers on it and things like that, because in a year I will know which of my readers download it most, you know? So, I mean, it's not, and this is for our listeners, you know, one book launch that fails does not mean you're always going to have failure. You know, you can actually learn from that and then move on, just write your next thing because then you can take what you learned and apply it to that same book even a year or two later and it's not a failure. Right. I've certainly had box sets that took off of the books one through three, even though the first book wasn't quite to market or I had the blurb, I didn't quite get it. So it's like you get another chance where like you were saying, you can just relaunch it too. Um, yeah, that's uh, I guess I'll just talk about my last thing <laughs> since I got my dog is laying on her back and rubbing it in the, on the yoga mat so a little distracted over here but my last thing is actually and this is something I really struggle with today even being aware of it is that I'm super impatient I'm so glad self-publishing became a thing because there was no way I was gonna be able to wait two years to maybe possibly have a book published and by the time it came out I wouldn't care about it anymore because that is honestly how I feel about stuff from like a series I finished two years ago I don't know the names of the characters I Maybe someday I'll listen to the audiobooks and enjoy it. But uh, I just, I really struggle with, as soon as I write something, I want to put it out there. You know, I'm okay at holding back to launch three in a row for a new series since that's worked quite well for me, you know, several times now. But I, I then fall back into, then I get caught up and I have to write one for the next month. And, you know, I've got deadlines with my editor. So I'm like, why am I putting this much pressure on myself? You know, I could just try to get a few ahead and then, you know, then if something happens and you can't work that week, you're fine. You're not like getting behind. So that's something I hope to be able to improve on in the future. I don't know if I'll ever have more patience, but at least getting a few ahead so I don't feel pressured to, you know, meet those deadlines. And then, you know, it's funny because they say like kids are impatient and then you you get more patient as you get older. And I don't think that's true because you get older and you're more aware of your own mortality and you have all these things you want to accomplish in the limited time you have left. So if you're patient, kudos to you. I don't know what that would be like. All right. Do you guys have any thoughts on that or should we wrap it up as my dogs are shaking their collars and demanding attention? I just think that uh, impatience has got to be one of the most common problems that independent authors have. Like, I think it might be a defining aspect of being an independent author. Is I just want to do it now. Yeah, no, that's definitely true with my clients. They're like, yeah, I, I really, I just want to, and I'm like, hey, you have to put this in place and it's going to take you time to build up your career. And then like a month later, they email me and they're like, everything's falling apart. Nothing's working. I'm like, it was a year process, not a one month process. <laughs> 
All right. Well, I'm glad I'm in good company. And um, we were going to do some listener questions, but since we ended up talking over an hour just about ourselves, hopefully something was useful, guys. We will do another show with uh, maybe just do all listener questions next time. And um, in the meantime, thank you for listening. You can visit sixfigureauthors.com with the number six for the episode notes or to leave a comment or ask a question for our future show. As we've mentioned a couple times now, you can also join us on Facebook with the Six Figure Authors Facebook group. And you can just search for that without the number six, just to be confusing. It is Six Figure Authors, or I put the link in the show notes. Uh, I think this is episode 20, if you want to grab it out of there. And please answer the beard question. It's I didn't mean for it to be a trick question. Uh, I got an interesting answer <laughs> the other day about beards, but um, no, I just meant to make sure people listen to the show, uh, you know, and can give the names of the hosts because, you know, people find the group randomly just by, you know, and they're probably like, oh, six figure authors, yay, 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 and just give some BS answers. And we're kind of actually disapproving those uh, just because we do want to kind of keep it a smaller community with, with you guys that are are listening. We really appreciate that. And, you know, we're trying to answer the questions there. And I love that you guys are talking to each other in the comments and feel free to make your own posts. And I guess that is enough blabbing for me. Do you guys have any final thoughts? Close out. Say goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> I, I will just say that my name is Joe and I have a beard. Just so you know. <laughs> oh, just give it away. <laughs> <laughs> Nope, nothing more for me. Talk to you all later. Bye. Come along, everybody. <laughs>